Thank you very much. First, I want to say thank you to Mohammed, to the organizers, to the funders uh, for this opportunity. I will try to speak slowly. Um, and Not too slowly, given the time is the question. And I will just introduce my version of water ethics because I think everybody has their own idea. Uh, where this idea comes from, uh, then I'll talk about different kinds or what I call categories of water ethics. And I will use the word ethics and values a little bit interchangeably. I am not a philosopher, I am an anthropologist. So, so I don't care about the exact definition of ethics, which is more of a philosophy term. And then I want to talk about applying water ethics in, in the practical situations and how it can be used as a, a type of language. We can talk about values as a way of relating different cultures, such as traditional and contemporary. So basically, I mean by water ethics the, the application of values, how we apply values. I, um, basically, every water decision, maybe every decision, has a moral dimension or an ethical dimension to it, or an ethical implication. Sometimes obvious, sometimes not obvious. Um, this is the photograph on my book on water ethics. And I chose this photograph because it, it shows the water supply, domestic water supply, but it also shows environment, that the, the trees around the pond are protected because they want to keep the water clean, but that provides habitat. There is a, you can see a social dynamic of, of women gathering together. You can see some men back here also smoking hookah. <laughs> That's also a social. Um, so it's, it's a practical, uh, practical activity of gathering water, but it has these other dimensions to it. And just three quick examples of water ethics from recent things. Uh, last year in the city of Detroit in the US, the, um, the mayor turned off the water supply to 3,000 houses, families, because they, had, they were more than three months behind. They had not paid their water bill for three months, turn off. So that became uh, uh, news because it violates the human right to water, or it's interpreted as violating the human right to water, which is a social ethic, I would say, according to my terminology. But the mayor said, well, his concern is, he, he is not not concerned with social ethic, but he is also concerned with economic ethic, or economic value, uh, that the water utility needs funding, needs money. So the point of that is that there, that every side has an ethic. And the, the question is, how do you <coughs> negotiate those, those sets of values? In, in India, I think, where in many villages, the uh, upper caste, there's caste discrimination. So that affects the ability of low caste people to have access to water. So that's a social problem. But from the perspective of a religious Hindu person, there's also a social ethic to, or a cultural ethic to, uh, uh, to follow the caste regulations. So we say that's, that's unethical, but it has, you know, it's, it's complicated, it's, it's wicked. And in my own region of New Mexico, in the southwest US, we don't have a river because it's, it's dangerous. <coughs> if, we've, if Spain still controlled 
New Mexico, which it used to do 200 years ago, we, we would be part of the, of the European water framework and our behavior would be illegal because we are, we are not allowing environmental flow in our river. We're, we're impounding the water. So from, from my perspective, that's, that's a, a, a bad environmental decision. From the uh, city, from the local water authorities' perspective, that's a good social and economic decision. So the idea is that, that ethics is not, not necessarily right or wrong. It's, it's, I, I use the term ethics in terms of a label for the values that are being applied to an activity. And I can uh, tell you where, where my ideas come from, but I have to admit that it's Anglophone version. I don't have uh, French literature uh, related to ethics. There is some. And all the uh, UNESCO publications are all in French and English and Spanish. But I won't go into these, just that there are some. Um, and this is my book. This is a more, uh, another recent book, Just, Just Water, means a Catholic perspective, a, a religious perspective on water. And uh, at the same year as the last water forum, uh, Water Policy had a special edition on, on water ethics, edited by Jerry Deli Priscilli, who was supposed to be here at one point. But just a few comments on the, the literature on, on water ethics. The early literature, early means 20 years ago, was describing the, the, the connections between ethics and water decisions, water policies. And there's been kind of an evolution towards more prescription, prescribing what, the, what values we should have about human right to water, uh, rights of nature. And I, this is my suggestion, is that the next phase of, of research on water ethics um, should, <laughs> I'm being prescriptive, uh, should look at the, the methods of how to apply water ethics in practical cases. And I'm going to do a uh, suggestion at the end. Now, I like to talk about different kinds of ethics, and that it's never black and white or blue and white. It's always a little bit vague. But roughly, we can talk about environmental values or environmental ethics. Environmental values of, about the uh, health of the water ecosystem, the ethics of taking care of the environment. That's, in philosophy, that's called environmental ethics. Um, but economic, economics also is about values, partly. That economists have values too. They, they think it's not just cost-benefit analysis, but there's a value in there that efficiency is, is, is a good thing. And um, avoiding waste is a good thing. And so the idea of virtual water, of Tony Allen, is these, we can, we have tools to minimize the water footprint. And that to me, that's an, what motivates the water footprint concept is an economic ethic of, of frugality is an English term, being frugal, being, being careful. And then social values about health are, uh, we heard in the, in the last uh, talk about the human right to water. Uh, that's very powerful, and it's not just human right to water, but human right to water and sanitation, and the whole aspect of health. But social values also mean equity of access, not just access, but uh, who has access to water, who has access to information about water. And then it gets into the government's issue. I, I see cultural values as, as a, a separate category. And there's a very nice uh, UN, United Nations resolution about 
uh, cultural values. In 2007, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, DRIP, D-R-I-P, sounds like water. Um, that that un specifies the right to free, prior, and informed consent. The indigenous people specifically have the right to know, to, to veto uh, water, any kind of development on their territory. In fact, they don't, but that's the, what the resolution says. And that resolution was, was signed by almost everybody. Even the United States, we were the last one to sign it. And then governance values, which is relevant to this, to this, to our topic today, that participation, transparency, uh, democracy in terms of water, democracy, that represents a value. There's nothing inherent in water that it, it has to be managed by a group instead of an individual. But I think there is a there's a important debate about the, the relative priority of group decision making versus individual decision making and governance. Should, should, uh, municip should municipal water supply be managed by a corporation or by the public? And you know, those are our value decisions. So you can map these out. Um, with the blue along the top are the kind of what I call categories of ethics, and the red on the side are the major water uses. And where I where I think that this is it's useful to divide this up is as a mental exercise or as a group process. We can think of well, we have we're concerned about the environment. Let's be concerned about the environment in each of the water use. Areas. What about energy, the environmental impacts of the water, environmental impacts on water from energy or from industry, or the, envir the urban environment, the urban water environment, uh, how is the, how healthy is the river? Uh, so, and just take urban, then you can look at, well, what about the social benefits that we that we have from our urban river? What about cultural, not just cultural impacts, but cultural benefits from the river? Recreation, uh, awareness of the water environment, a lot of intangibles. And uh, how much economic value are we getting from the water in the ecosystem, the water in agriculture? See, it becomes a way of like a table of contents of trying to understand your water system from a values perspective. And this is just a diagram which shows that, as we all know, everything is interconnected. But what that means is that there are no clear boundaries also, that, that the ecosystem services concept, is that environmental or economic? Well, it's both, and it can be given a different flavor depending on how on how that analysis is actually used. So how to apply water ethics. Um, this is a, even, I had to think like, what, what does it mean to apply water ethics? And I, I think, first of all, it means becoming aware of what the values are that are being expressed in the way water is used. Okay, so we're all, we use water, I'll give an example. I turn the water on to brush my teeth. At what point do I turn the water off? How long does the water run? How, well, that, to me, that's an, that's an economic uh, value. I don't want to waste water. That's, but that's not really a social value to me. That's just, it's, it's just like, even if there's enough water, I don't want to waste it. So that's, I think that's the kind of, of sense that we want to promote. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a perception. Uh, so 
when we, so I say, establish a thoroughly vetted framework of water ethics principles that can provide a starting point for local efforts. Uh, the Water Ethics Charter is something I'll talk about in a minute, which tries to do that. Um, another way, so one way to apply ethics is to write down what the, what the ethics are for within the local scene, within the whatever unit we're talking about, watershed, city. These are the principles that we want to live by, or an institution. Uh, Mohammed, when you mentioned the GWP, the Global Water Partnership definition of governance, and governance has these principles. Well, you're, so GWP as an organization is, in, in, my, in my language, they are creating a, a list of governance principles. And so that, that's a kind of a moral act. It's a good thing. Um, then in terms of planning, in, ethics can be used as a participatory planning process. When you have all the stakeholders in a room for planning the, the, the future of the watershed, well, what is it that you're talking about? Um, in where I live, where the climate is like Morocco, what people talk about is where can we get more water and how are we going to increase our water supply? Can we, can we build a pipeline from someplace else and bring it here? That's, that's part of the planning, but that's, that's not a very enlightened form of planning, I think. I think part of planning should be looking at the values that we as stakeholders want to live by, the rules that we want to be governed by in, in our use of water. So I call that values-based planning. And one um, uh, stipulation or one clarification is to focus on a manageable scale so that you can do something about it rather than trying to uh, manage the Rhine River all at once. Maybe start with a small tributary, for example, or a city. Now, the, so the Water Ethics Charter is, is something that came out of, I'm gonna go backwards. It came out from the 2012, from last World Water Forum in Marseille. One of the recommendations was that we need a water, we need a water ethics charter. There was work done by UNESCO uh, 15 years ago, and there was continued work from Botine Foundation and other. There's been this fairly steady stream of water ethics little bit. If, if you take any report that is released in the next month and you, you find in your intra, in your email, another report from Global Water Partnership or from World Bank on state of, the, of water, water security, you search for the word ethic, you will not find it. It's, it's as if the word ethic exists neither in English nor in French. It's not used. I mean, I, I, I do a monthly newsletter on water ethics, and I routinely check the reports, and it's very rare for the, even the word to appear. But um, somehow this recommendation did come out of Marseille, and um, the French Water Academy in Paris, and UNESCO, and Water Culture Institute, my institute, uh, decided to pick this up, this idea. And we've been, we had a meeting one year ago, Louise was present in, at UNESCO in Paris to, to uh, create a framework for a water ethics charter. It exists in draft form, which is, you can find this on the, on the website, waterethics.org. Um, but the, the, the approach that we're taking is we don't want to create anything brand new. There are already a lot of ethical standards that have been agreed upon. The Dublin Principles is very, um, is filled with values. Uh, uh, participatory governance, uh, the idea of managing at the smallest level possible, local level management. Uh, 
gender, which doesn't come out here, but uh, the role, recognizing the role of women in water management was very clear in the Dublin Principles. I think we've gone backwards a little bit since then. Uh, the concept of in, in bar, uh, sorry, responsible use, that's not wasting and, and using water for a, for, an import, for a reasonable purpose. So, and most recently, the bottom of the water stewardship standard is, a, I think, a really interesting document, very detailed set of, of not just guidelines, but requirements for being a water steward. So I'm going to go to, so the, the charter that we're drafting is going to be very short. It's like a 10 commandments of water. Uh, it's going to have, it will probably, we, we're still in early stages, it will have something environmental, something economic, social, cultural, and governance. It will cover all those things to some extent. It's going to be a little bit vague. Probably, probably it will say rights of nature in, in some form, because that's a, a big issue, and I, I appreciated whoever spoke this morning about that's one of the, um, I think it was you, I believe, who said that the uh, recognizing the nature's rights is, is part of the kind of civilizational debate going on in our, at the global level now. Uh, and I think that in the water, in the world of water, we also need to address that question. So the, the charter that we're working on is going to be a global statement. And as Carl said, it's not going to do anything because it's at that level, what can it do? But it can be a, a, a reference point. It can be just like any resolution. Human, it, it doesn't have any teeth. It, it's not, you can't enforce it. I mean, we, we don't intend to try to enforce the ethics charter, but it can be a template for working at the local level. So I think that the, the main value of the water ethics charter could be in not so much what it says, but the fact that it tries to write, put down in writing principles about water. And it can be used at the local level. And that's what I have, what I'm trying to say with one through four, how to do it. Um, and this is speculation. We haven't done this yet. I would love to have an opportunity to, to try it out and see how it works. But the steps would be convene everybody. Basically, the steps are a multi-stakeholder framework. Everybody knows kind of what that means. To get all the different stakeholders together, maybe in a series of workshops. And, and they would uh, agree to, let's write our own water ethics charter. And that would force them, or give them an incentive, to try to work out how can we, what common principles can we agree on between industry, agriculture, uh, environmental groups, social activists, and how much pollution should we allow in the river? And that's going to be uh, controversial between industry and, and, and social groups. But there's no, I think it's better to to be controversial at the level of principles and values rather than over a specific fact. Like, your factory is polluting the stream. Well, don't argue about that. Argue about how, how clean, how important is water quality in that stream. And establish that principle first. And then you can, then you'll have a basis for negotiating with the, with the factory saying, well, you are, this is not consistent with what we all agreed on as a principle for operating, for, for managing the river. So that, number three, use the process of the agreed upon code of behavior, that's the, the ethics charter, to motivate conflicting stakeholders to find consensus. And then maybe, create uh, some kind of institution to monitor compliance, to monitor are you, are we, uh, are we living in, the, in a way that is consistent with 
our promises. And that committee might serve as a type of basin committee. OK, last point, last section, is the ethics as a common language. So what I'm suggesting is that translating potential conflicts into the language of values can reduce tensions. So that's like a water diplomacy function. But also, understanding the values of other stakeholders uh, can we all put our, I'm concerned about fish in the river. I want the fish to be healthy. So I want really very clean water and cool water. I don't want any pollution. But we also need, in the river, we also need jobs. We need economic benefits. Well, how can my fish live with a, a power generation plant? The power plant is going to put warm water in the river. Well, then, with, if those values are clear, my fish are important to me, your power plant is important to you, well, let's find a way that I can have fish and you can have power. And then it becomes, it's not a conflict, it's a design parameter. It's, a, it's a, a design constraint. And we can look for solutions that allow both to happen. So we find a way to cool the water, we find a way maybe make a passage for the fish around the, the warm areas in, in the river or something like that. So this is where I, I feel there's a, a, there's a creative element to, to water ethics, or there can be, that ethics, by being very trans, transparent about what are the principles that we want to uh, live with, and then, you know, it's like, live your dream. Live according to your dream. Don't live according to your fears. Well, so we can dream the, the kind of watershed that we want to have, the kind of river we want to have. And it's a challenge to the, the design community to do that. I'm working with a, an organization in the, in the US called Biomimicry. Institute, biomimicry. They're mimicking the designs of nature, and we're uh, trying to find ways of having water savings designs using designs from nature. And it's a very creative process. It attracts a lot of young people, and that's a, a good sign. Um, so related to the last point, could a similar dynamic help modern agricultural engineers as well as urban consumers appreciate traditional irrigation systems and traditional farming systems. So the thought here is that when you translate the, the values of uh, traditional agriculture, traditional irrigation, <coughs> you find things like community consensus building, solidarity, respect of nature, respect for each other, <coughs> sharing, sharing, cooperation, all those things. And especially the, the relationship with, with nature and living inside natural boundaries. That that could be a way of, of uh, developing greater support from civil society uh, by identifying, look at all these benefits that, traditional agri that this traditional agriculture is providing. And isn't that great? And giving a, helping to revalue um, the agriculture in the minds of, the, of local citizens. So uh, traditional communities know that they have cultural and ethical values because they are minorities. They, they are aware that there's a big outside world that does not live according to their traditional ways. But modern water and agriculture sectors don't really have that perspective. We think we are, we are modern. You have to, you traditional people have to change your ways. That this is the inevitable destiny of you. And I think what we, what values, the values perspective can show. It's it's not either inevitable or actually desirable to to adopt 
a water management or agricultural management which we have, which most reasonable people know is not sustainable. So we're not saying you have to be traditional, but let's let's identify the values that that, that traditional agriculture, traditional communities still exhibit and redesign water management and agricultural management according to those values. And that means um, learning to view modern agriculture from an ethics perspective would serve to revalue traditional agriculture, recognize its multifunctional benefits, and to do that we would look for a local level values-based planning for both water and irrigation, which uses most of the water. And this is not all that new. Um, in 2009, the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development said pretty much the same thing. How, how many, does anybody recognize this report? Mm -hmm. The World Bank was involved, FAO was involved, and there's been very little <coughs> communication about it because the report was much more radical than the World Bank and FAO was comfortable with. But it said some of these same things. And so to sum up, see that's the conclusion. Oops. Um, I'll just read this. As both, as both traditional and modern farmers face an uncertain economic and climatic future, clarity about values and priorities becomes particularly important. And in urban sitting settings, healthy natural rivers, clean groundwater are becoming more appreciated for reasons of water security, disaster mitigation, as well as aesthetics, recreation, and economics. So to conclude, attention to the values underlying our water policies and investments will become increasingly critical for sustainable water future. <coughs> By practicing ethics awareness, we can construct a bridge of respect between traditional and contemporary systems of water governance. Thank you for your attention. Right, well, thank you very much. That's uh, Bali, by the way. At Bali, okay. So we started with uh, uh, Rajasthan and Haryana, and now we're in Bali. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so we will have uh, a couple of uh, sort of formal comments just to round up, but we have time for a couple of uh, comments uh, from other members of the group. And I can see one hand there already. Please. Yes. Yes, David. <coughs> Thank you. Very inspir inspiring presentation. What I miss. I do not see once the word interest. Interest, interest. Mm -hmm. You know, at the at the very end, you it's not only the values. We have to work with explicit interests, and then we can still differentiate in legitimate interests and not legitimate interests. But uh, you do not, you know, especially for the noble for the noble social strata, it's a it's a survival, it's, it's a very hardcore basic needs interest that cannot be substituted by a, by a value statement. That's one thing. So I would spend some thoughts on how do we deal with interests, and the answer is make them explicit. Put them on the table, then they can be challenged, and then they are transparent. That's one thing. The second thing is, and I very much support you theoretically, on monitoring. Fact is, we are in the middle of a reporting fatigue. If you go into every sustainable development issue or the global compact, there is a close cooperation with the global reporting initiative, and they ask for 1,522 indicators to be reported upon, and nobody wants to do that. Because you know a big company could hire five people to do all the bureaucratic work that goes along with it, but the majority can't. So what you have to do is either find a proxy that you can measure without asking people uh, to report, or to sit on the back of somebody else who already is collecting data from which you are able 
to roughly but correctly assess what it is all about. And uh, last remark, <coughs> measurement and values, as we discussed all day, will play a big role in the whole post-2015 development agenda um, period, and there will be great resistance. There will be resistance from the states, from the, from the governments, there will be resistance from industry, and there will be requests and demands from the NGOs. So you say measurement of values. Measurement and values. And values. Measurement and values. Will really play up because, you know, you, you normally you say if you can't measure it, you know, you can't deliver. Yeah. And, uh, and the last one to use a, a private sector approach is if you can measure it and if you can, you know, that's one thing, and if you have targets, that's another thing, but how can you reward it? How can you give incentives? How can you help that the good intentions and the values that we all have in the back of our brain become beneficial in a more than immaterial sense? I'm not a pessimist. I am an idealist, but this is a, in a nutshell yeah. circumscribes the experience I have. Yeah. Could we just have a couple of other comments in the last day for just one? No? I thought I saw your hand up. I hope that maybe you'd like to well, comment I, on I, some I, values. Yeah. Of course I agree with you. Right. <laughs> um, I think what I I use the, 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 the term of economic values as a bit something of a proxy, a proxy for, for interests. I mean, I, I, I think what I, if we have a multi-stakeholder process, we're all representing the, local, the river here. I don't even know the name of it, but I did walk along it yesterday. The, um, that, and we had representatives from industry, from fishing, from tourism, from, you know, from everybody. Then, and, and we also had representatives from the landless and the, you know, the, the urban poor workers and the homeless. In, in the U.S., we'd have to have the homeless represented because we have so many. That, that the idea of, well, we need economic productivity from this river as well as, as ecology, that would come out, of course. But I, I, but I think I like your term, interest. I think that makes it more, uh, makes it more firm. And enlightened self-interest and long-term interest, not short-term. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for reporting, if it's reporting, reporting fatigue, if, if it's decentralized, if it's a really local river, and there are good, there is, is authentic representation from the interest groups. I think that some qualitative level reporting could be sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. And Employ grant models. They yeah. have the highest motivation to look after the welfare of their grandchildren. Yeah. Well, one thing we haven't talked about is youth or haven't talked about much. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, it, we, we have a, a little coalition, a steering committee of, of the Water Ethics Charter, but one of our members, we have an indigenous representative, um, and we have a youth representative, but the youth representative is from Water Youth, Water Youth, Youth Water Network, and it's an international organization of youth, and there, there are several international youth organizations working on water issues. So it's, there, there's, there is an organized group to contact and say, we would like your input. And I'm, we're hoping that the youth, the youth will take the water ethics concept to heart because for the same reason, they, they, they have the most to lose or most to gain. But maybe grandmothers could come though too. <laughs>